Hello, today I'll be discussing an approach to chronic diarrhea. Before covering the diagnostic framework, I need to define chronic diarrhea. Surprisingly, diarrhea has no uniform definition in medicine. It can be based upon the absolute number of bowel movements per 24 hours, the stool volume per 24 hours, or the patient's subjective assessment of their stool's consistency. The categorization of diarrhea based on duration is more uniform. If it's been occurring for 14 days or less, it's referred to as an acute diarrhea. 14 to 30 days is persistent diarrhea. And diarrhea that's been ongoing for over 30 days, or sometimes listed as 4 weeks, is chronic. An important distinction to make early in the diagnostic assessment is whether a patient is experiencing diarrhea or fecal incontinence. The reason it's important is because they have different causes, but unfortunately, the distinction can be challenging because loose stools are more difficult to hold in the rectum compared to solid stool, so diarrhea can unmask or worsen a pre-existing problem with continence. When it comes to the diagnostic framework, I'm going to start very general. The first level of organization to the list of etiologies is to separate them into causes of non-inflammatory versus inflammatory diarrhea. In non-inflammatory diarrhea, stool can either be watery or greasy. It may or may not be associated with abdominal pain. Bloating and flatulence are common, but systemic symptoms such as fever and fatigue are not. In inflammatory diarrhea, the stool is mixed with blood and or mucus. There is usually concurrent abdominal pain, which in some cases occurs predominantly during the bowel movements themselves, while in other cases the pain is present more consistently. Systemic symptoms are common. With that in mind, let's look at where individual etiologies lie. Under the broad heading of non-inflammatory diarrhea, we have multiple subcategories which differ a little in the history. First is osmotic diarrhea in which the problem is the presence of a non-absorbable osmotically active substance in the colon. This presents with a modest volume of diarrhea that is typically associated with the ingestion of specific foods or medications. It includes lactose intolerance, artificial sweeteners such as sorbitol and high fructose corn syrup, medications such as a carbose magnesium hydroxide, also known as milk of magnesia, and lactulose, and laxative abuse, as might occur as part of an eating disorder or factitious disorder, in which case it is known as factitious diarrhea. Secretory diarrhea is relatively rare and associated with a very high volume of watery stools which continue overnight, a relatively uncommon phenomenon in other forms of diarrhea. In this category is microscopic colitis, a chronic inflammatory disease of the colon of undetermined etiology but which is thought to be triggered by NSAID use in some cases. A secretory diarrhea can also be a medication side effect, as seen with NSAIDs, even without the development of microscopic colitis, and colchicine. Several rare neuroendocrine tumors, which produce hormones, can cause secretory diarrhea, in particular, carcinoid syndrome, caused by a serotonin-secreting GI or lung tumor, and a gastrin-secreting tumor known as a gastrinoma, which is also known as zollinger ellison syndrome. In malabsorptive diarrhea, stools can be, but are not always, greasy and unusually foul-smelling. Notable etiologies of malabsorptive diarrhea include celiac disease, also known as celiac sprue. Other etiologies here include pancreatic insufficiency, in which the pancreas does not produce its normal alkaline, enzyme-rich pancreatic fluid to aid in digestion, as can be seen in chronic pancreatitis and cystic fibrosis. Tropical sprue is a chronic diarrheal illness seen predominantly in the tropics. Its pathogenesis is unknown, but is widely speculated to be infectious in origin. Omelsartan is a angiotensin receptor blocker used for hypertension and is one of the few medications that can also cause a malabsorptive diarrhea with a similar presentation to celiac disease, a condition termed drug-induced enteropathy. The last subcategory of non-inflammatory diarrhea is hypermotility, where we find irritable bowel syndrome and hyperthyroidism. Inflammatory diarrhea can be subdivided into infectious and non-infectious etiologies. Infectious etiologies include viruses, such as advanced HIV and CMV, and mycobacteria, such as tuberculosis, 
and Mycobacterium avium complex. While conventional bacteria such as enteroinvasive E. coli are major etiologies of acute inflammatory diarrhea, these infections do not generally last more than several weeks. Non-infectious etiologies include both subtypes of inflammatory bowel disease and radiation enteritis and proctitis, which is usually a long-term side effect of radiation therapy for intra-abdominal and intra-pelvic malignancies. Symptoms can develop months or even years after the radiation exposure. Regarding this diagnostic framework, unfortunately, it's not perfect as there are a number of etiologies which can cause diarrhea via multiple mechanisms. These include small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, medications such as PPIs, metformin, mycophenolate, and various anti-neoplastic drugs, a variety of protozoal infections, C. diff infections, Whipple's disease caused by chronic infection with the bacteria T. whippleyi, post-cholecystectomy diarrhea due to excessive bile acids entering the GI lumen, and last, alcohol consumption. In the U.S., the most common causes of chronic diarrhea are lactase deficiency, celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and IBD. Unfortunately, I can't point out the most common causes of chronic diarrhea worldwide because we just don't know, but it's speculated to be primarily infectious. So what aspects of the patient history are important when evaluating chronic diarrhea? Obviously, it's chronology. How long has it been going on for? Is it episodic or continuous? Meaning, does it uh, resolve for days or weeks at a time before recurring? Or is it present daily? And does the diarrhea occur with equal frequency at night, most commonly described with secretory diarrhea? Are there triggers, such as specific foods, which would be the case with lactose intolerance, or emotional stress, most commonly described in irritable bowel syndrome? What is the response of diarrhea to fasting? Improvement suggests an osmotic or malabsorption etiology. What are the characteristics of stool? For example, does it contain blood or mucus? Is it greasy or unusually malodorous? Are there associated symptoms, including nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, fever, weight loss, alternating constipation, or fecal incontinence? Ask the patient what medications they're on, including over-the-counter drugs and herbals. Travel history and possible environmental exposures are both very important. And last, ask about HIV risk factors, as the probability of an infectious etiology of a chronic diarrhea is dramatically increased if that patient also has HIV. In addition to the vitals, other parts of a focused physical exam include a thorough abdominal exam, as well as a rectal exam to assess anal sphincter tone. The stool can be tested for occult blood, and the thyroid exam should be performed if the possibility of hyperthyroidism is suggested by history. Key labs in the workup of a patient presenting with chronic diarrhea include a CBC looking for leukocytosis that can be seen in inflammatory etiologies, and looking for anemia as a consequence of nutrient deficiencies or occasionally if there's GI bleeding associated with diarrhea. A basic metabolic panel isn't usually helpful for establishing the cause of diarrhea, but it can check for secondary electrolyte abnormalities and for renal impairment caused by volume depletion. An HIV test is also usually ordered even if a patient does not have or report any HIV risk factors. Additional frequently considered tests, depending on the preceding information, include a stool culture, C. diff toxin, and if the patient has a history of HIV or unusual travel or environmental exposures, a stool ONP looking for parasites. Upper endoscopy with duodenal biopsy is used to diagnose celiac disease, while colonoscopy is usually necessary to diagnose inflammatory bowel disease. The stool osmotic gap, which can help differentiate osmotic from secretory diarrhea, it's calculated as 290 minus 2 times the sum of the stool sodium and potassium as measured in milliequivalents per liter. Serologic testing for celiac disease should be performed if there is evidence of that possibility. A discussion of the specific antibodies for celiac disease and their individual test characteristics is beyond the focus of this particular video. And last, consider testing for various nutrients such as iron, vitamin D, and vitamin B12 if the patient has malabsorption 
and or anemia. Now, I'm going to take a slightly deeper dive into the presentation and workup of the subtypes of diarrhea, starting with osmotic. Patients usually present with a modest volume of watery bowel movements that are relieved by fasting. Sometimes, they will already have identified an association with specific foods or medications, but not always. The exam is normal, and nonspecific lab tests such as CBC and a basic metabolic panel are usually normal. The workup for an apparent osmotic diarrhea includes a food diary and a trial avoiding certain foods or medications. One can consider a diagnostic fast in which the patient avoids eating anything but water for a period of time. There is no standard duration for a diagnostic fast, but in adult patients, 24 to 48 hours is typical. A stool osmotic gap greater than 125 is consistent with an osmotic mechanism. A lactose hydrogen breath test can be ordered if lactose intolerance is suspected, though a careful food diary is often sufficient for this diagnosis. Finally, if laxative abuse is suspected, a colonoscopy can be performed, which may show a finding called melanosis coli caused by pigment-laden macrophages in the colonic wall. In secretory diarrhea, patients present with high volume of watery bowel movements that are not relieved with fasting and may continue unchanged overnight. The physical exam and routine labs are usually normal. Tests specific for secretory diarrhea include a diagnostic fast to confirm the lack of improvement, a stool osmotic gap will be low, contrasting it with osmotic diarrhea. A CT of the abdomen and pelvis, as well as specific hormone testing, can be considered if a neuroendocrine tumor is suspected. In malabsorptive diarrhea, characterized by greasy and foul-smelling stool, weight loss is common, and patients may have symptoms of nutrient deficiencies if the malabsorption is particularly bad. The exam is usually normal, but routine tests may show evidence of anemia related to iron, B12, or folate deficiency, or there may be calcium and phosphate abnormalities related to vitamin D deficiency. Further assessment for malabsorption includes an assessment of stool fat, which can either be a qualitative Sudan stain of the stool, or a quantitative measure of stool fat during a 72-hour collection while on a diet specifically containing 100 grams of fat per day, the latter of which is not commonly done in practice. Upper endoscopy is often performed, plus or minus an ERCP, if a primary pancreatic etiology is suspected, or rarely colonoscopy. Abdominal imaging can also help make a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. Other blood tests include the aforementioned serologic testing for celiac disease, as well as a test called fecal elastase 1, a deficiency of which indicates pancreatic insufficiency. In diarrhea associated with hypermotility, specifically IBS, nocturnal BMs and weight loss are particularly uncommon, but there is often an association between symptoms and emotional and or environmental stress. If the diarrhea is due to IBS, the exam and labs are usually normal. If due to hyperthyroidism, the exam may have various findings associated with that diagnosis. In suspected hypermotility diarrhea, aside from checking a TSH, there really isn't much more However, one might consider testing for celiac disease given its relatively high prevalence among patients with chronic diarrhea. Last, in inflammatory diarrhea, the stool is bloody and or mixed with mucus. Abdominal pain is common. In patients specifically with IBD, joint and skin symptoms are also common. Patients with inflammatory diarrhea often have signs of systemic inflammation, such as fever and tachycardia. The stool is usually guaiac positive, and anal fissures and or fistulas specifically suggest IBD over infectious etiologies. Conventional labs often show a leukocytosis and an elevated ESR and or CRP. The primary diagnostic test in chronic inflammatory diarrhea is colonoscopy, though the best timing for this is not always clear as there may be an increased risk to the patient if done during a period of severe colitis. Fecal calprotectin, a protein produced by neutrophils, has replaced fecal leukocytes as a non-invasive test to confirm the presence of inflammation. And one should consider testing for C. diff, particularly if the patient has been recently hospitalized and or received antibiotics. The key takeaway points for this video. Chronic diarrhea is defined as either increased stool frequency, increased stool volume, or subjectively loose stools occurring for at least one month. 
The first distinction during the workup is determining if the diarrhea is inflammatory or non-inflammatory. Non-inflammatory diarrhea is further classified based on mechanism as either osmotic versus secretory versus malabsorptive versus hypermotility, though the distinction between these four is not always clear-cut in practice. There are many potential tests involved in the diagnostic evaluation of chronic diarrhea, the selection of which is strongly influenced by the suspected mechanism, which itself is influenced by aspects of the patient's history. And last, the most common etiologies of chronic diarrhea in the United States are lactose intolerance, celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and inflammatory bowel disease.